Welcome to our last video for the course. Today we're going to talk about Putnam and Lewis, two of the most important philosophers of the second half of the 20th century, and two of the most important philosophers in philosophy done in the analytic tradition. Part of what makes these people so impressive and important is that both of them have incredible formal skills. In fact, I think it's reasonable to say that if you have something to say in M&E or language and mind, you're going to have to have superb technical skills. So one of the things that happened in the last, oh, I suppose 20 years or so is that advertisements in philosophy, when they were looking for new professors or something like that, they would advertise for lemmings. L-E-M-M-I-N-G-S. And the first four letters were capitalized to stand for language, epistemology, metaphysics, and mind. And the term was coined for the people who did work like David Lewis does. Lewis is an expert in all four of those areas, more in terms of metaphysics, language, and mind than epistemology. But he's, he wrote an important paper, Elusive Knowledge, in the 1990s, where he defended a version of contextualism about knowledge. We're not going to focus on that paper. Today, we're going to talk about his philosophy of mind paper, Mad Pain and Martian Pain. And we're going to look at Putnam's view on meaning, which extends some of Kripke's insights about rigid designation from proper names to natural kind terms. Let's put it that way. Natural kind terms are things like tiger, oak tree, that sort of thing, to be contrasted with terms that pick out artifacts, like table, chair, computer, printer, all of those things are artifacts, things constructed in order to fulfill a certain function and constructed by human beings. So tools in general will count as artifacts, not as natural kinds. Hoes and axes and table saws and that sort of thing knives, all of those are artifacts rather than natural kinds. In any case, let's look at the slide information, the notes on Putnam and Lewis. The paper I asked you to read was Hillary Putnam's paper, Meaning and Reference. Putnam's paper is really important for beginning a decades-long investigation of the relationship between mind and language, especially. Putnam does it through a notion of meaning. So he says at the beginning of the paper, he's interested in two unchallenged assumptions. The first is that knowing the meaning of a term is a matter of being in a certain psychological state. That seems like a very natural thing to assume, except for the word knowing. Perhaps you might balk a little bit at the idea that any psychological state could all by itself be a state of knowing, because it looks like knowing is factive, and so to know something is a state that you can be in that may have a psychological component, but is not itself just a psychological state. It's a factive psychological state, which means the world has something to say about whether you're in that state. That's an interesting challenge. That's an interesting qualification on point A here. I want to point out, though, that in recent years, probably since about the 1990s, one of the most famous philosophers currently working, and he's still working, is a philosopher who's now at Oxford. He was not always at Oxford, and when he began his work, he wasn't. But he went to school at Oxford. He was a Michael Dummett student and has considerable technical skills. He worked initially. Dummett, by the way, is the most uh, important philosopher of logic of the 20th century. And Williamson was a student of his. Dummett is famous for defending intuitionism in the philosophy of mathematics and logic. Williamson also studied with him, but didn't become a fan. There's a sort of in-crowdish element to the Dummett crowd. 
Williamson never was one of the in-crowd people, and in fact is one of the most important critics of intuitionism, of the kind of anti-realism that Dummett's intuitionism embodies. In any case, Williamson started working both in philosophy of logic, but also in metaphysics and epistemology. And one of his early notorious theses is that knowing is itself a mental state. So the challenge to Putnam might be met by taking a look at Williamson's defense of knowledge being a mental state. But in any case, the first assumption has that proviso, that qualification that probably needs to be made and either addressed in Williamsonian fashion or altered slightly. In any case, the unchallenged assumption, the first one is that to know the meaning of a term is a matter of being in a certain psychological state. We could maybe reword that by saying our understanding of meaning or something like that. Our grasp of the meaning of a term is a matter of being in a certain psychological state. In any case, this is a kind of internalism about meaning that Putnam is going to want to resist. One thing to ask ourselves here is how does Grice's how does Grice's work on the notion of meaning fit in here? Because remember, Grice holds that semantic meaning is built out of speaker meaning. Notice that Grice's semantic meaning isn't going to be a matter of if you know the if you grasp the semantic meaning of a term, that's more than being in a certain psychological state because semantic meaning isn't a matter of personal, individual, subjective attitudes at all. It's built out of those, but it's not just a matter of that. Speaker meaning may be a matter of being in a certain psychological state, but semantic meaning isn't. So you might question whether Putnam is right that these assumptions are really unchallenged. It looks to me like that's a slight exaggeration at least. The second assumption is the Fregian assumption, that you run through something like sense or meaning in order to determine extension. So the sense of the morning star makes a bridge between your idea of the morning star in Frege and Venus, which is the referent of the idea, the term that you're using. So according to Putnam, the second unchallenged assumption is that meaning determines extension. It's worth looking at the history of analytic philosophy up to the 1960s and 70s to ask yourself whether anybody who talks about meaning might challenge this second one. The first one we clearly find rejected, I think, in the work of Grice. But the second one, the Fregian assumption, is challenged at best independently. Remember, Russell was worried in on denoting that the whole attempt to distinguish sense and reference in Frege was misconceived and should be thought of otherwise. And when we get done taking a look at Russell's account, his semantic theory, it turns out there isn't any role left for senses. There is such a notion as reference in Russell you get reference for demonstratives like this and that, and maybe indexicals like I and me. Other than that, you get acquaintance with universals. What's the story about meaning in Russell that would get meaning to determine extension? It's not clear to me that Russell would even understand that kind of language, except as a hand-waving gesture towards Frege's attempt to distinguish sense and reference. So maybe neither of these assumptions is as widespread as Putnam claims, but they're very natural ones to make. Your grasp of the meaning of a term looks like a matter of being in a certain psychological state, and the meaning of the term is what bridges the gap between the syntax of the language and the stuff you're actually talking about. It's the second one that Putnam wants to attack first. And he does it with his famous twin earth experiment. It's a thought experiment. So you're imagining two different possible worlds. You're not thinking about, 
it's not really clear here that he's doing this, but I think the best way to take it is you're talking about two different possible worlds, not two planets within our galaxy or two planets within galaxies that are separated in space and time, where one is called twin Earth and another one is called Earth. I think it's really two different possible worlds. So there's Earth, the planet we inhabit, and then there's another possible world where there's a planet just like ours, except in our world, water is constituted by H2O. It is identical with H2O. And in this other planet, there's some other chemical structure that is water. Now, what that means is in the other planet, there's a liquid that looks like water, behaves like water, is used in the same way as we use water, but its chemical composition is really XYZ. That's a placeholder for something we know not what. We don't know what XYZ is, but it doesn't matter. The only thing that's important is XYZ is not H2O. So we have two terms that we should introduce. We should have water sub twin earth and water sub earth. Putnam's point is the meaning of these two terms is different because water sub earth refers to the H2O substance and water sub twin earth refers to XYZ. We can use the same kind of example to challenge the other assumption as well. If you go back to pre-chemistry times, people talked about water all the time. They were in a particular psychological state. So you can have a person back in 1750, I think that's early enough to be pre-development of chemistry where the structure of water was not yet understood in terms of H2O. You've got one guy, Oscar, and then you've got a current person who does understand current chemical theory. And in some sense, they're both in the same psychological state if meaning is a matter of being in the same psychological state because they both use water. Well, it's water sub E in the same sense there's something that they have in common. Putnam's point is what they have in common is not a full grasp of the meaning of the term because they're really talking about H2O. So if they're in the same psychological state, then meaning doesn't determine extension. And if meaning does determine extension, then they can't be in the same psychological state. So in any case, both of them are challenged in the same way. Putnam extends these examples to the aluminum and molybdenum case and the Elm and Beach case. In both of those cases, we know that the substances in question are different, but we may not have a grasp of the difference. We may not have any way of expressing what the difference between an elm and a beech or a birch and a beech tree are, even though we know that they're different. That's all that we know. In response to these sorts of thought experiments, and in the case of the last two, they're not really thought experiments, they're probably personal history. I think Putnam is telling the truth when he doesn't know how to distinguish an elm from a beech tree or aluminum from molybdenum. Maybe he does, but there's at least lots of us who can't distinguish the two. In response to this, Putnam proposes a sociolinguistic hypothesis called the division of linguistic labor. He uses the example of gold, pointing out that when it comes to natural kind terms, we defer to the experts. We have certain functional roles that gold plays in our lives. You know, it's this yellow colored substance that is relatively soft in its pure form. So if you bite it with your teeth, you can put a dent in it, that sort of thing. Nonetheless, the true nature of gold and what 
the natural kind term gold refers to is something that we leave to the experts. He contrasts this with artifacts. Artifacts are not natural kind terms, and we don't defer to experts about what a chair is. If somebody brings a table in and says, I'm really an expert furniture maker, and you think this is a table, but it's not, it's really a chair, we don't defer to experts when it comes to artifacts like that. But we do when it comes to gold, and he thinks that's the right way to think about it. So here's a quote. Every linguistic community exemplifies the sort of division of linguistic labor just described. That is, it possesses at least some terms whose associated criteria are known only to a subset of the speakers who acquire the terms, and whose use by the other speakers depends upon a structured cooperation between them and the speakers in the relevant subsets. So the, the people who possess the associated criteria are the experts, and the rest of us just defer to them. Putnam then turns to the question of indexicality and rigidity. So he says, in response to the thought experiments that he was thinking about, take the twin earth case. He says, one might hold that the word water is world relative, but constant in meaning, so that the meaning is the same between earth and twin earth. On this theory, water means the same in the two worlds. It's just that water is H2O in world one and XYZ in world two. So that's the world relative account of meaning. One might hold that water is H2O in all worlds. The stuff called water in Twin Earth really isn't water. But water doesn't have the same meaning in the two terms. Here's Putnam's response. And in it, he refers to Kripke's discussion of what a rigid designator is. So proper names, ordinary proper names, according to Kripke, are rigid designators. Richard Nixon is a rigid de designator. Donald Trump is a rigid designator. The inventor of bifocals, that's not a rigid designator. The morning star, the evening star, those aren't rigid. There are some complications to this way of drawing the distinction because there are definite descriptions that come to be rigid. The Empire State Building, for example, is maybe a rigid designator. The Holy Roman Empire is perhaps a rigid designator because I can't remember who pointed this out. The Holy Roman Empire came to be neither holy, maybe it never was holy, nor Roman. So the HRE, that might have been a definite description, which is nonetheless to be understood as a proper name instead of a definite description as Russell would have it be understood. In any case, here's a quote about Kripke's use of the language of rigidity. Kripke calls a designator rigid in a given sentence if in that sentence it refers to the same individual in every possible world in which the designator designates. So keep the semantic content of the rest of the sentence, of the entire sentence as it is, and we get same individual picked out across possible worlds. If we extend this notion of rigidity to substance names, then we may express Kripke's theory in mind by saying that the term water is rigid. So Putnam says the term water picks out the same H2O substance in every world. So in Twin Earth, the word water is not a term with the same meaning as it is in this world. So this is Putnam's defense of the second option over the first. He grants, however, that it's conceivable but not possible that water is not H2O on the assumption that it actually is H2O. If it actually is H2O, then water is H2O and identities are necessary. So on the assumption that water is H2O, it couldn't be otherwise. But it is nonetheless, there's some sense of conceivability here in which it is conceivable that water isn't H2O, even though it couldn't be otherwise. Here's his summary. We have now seen that the extension of a term is not fixed 
by a concept that the individual speaker has in his head. And this is true both because extension is, in general, determined socially. There is division of linguistic labor as much as, a, as of real labor. And because extension is, in part, determined indexically. The extension of our terms depends upon the actual nature of the particular things that serve as paradigms, and this actual nature is not, in general, fully known to the speaker. Traditional semantic theory leaves out two contributions to the determination of reference, the contribution of society and the contribution of the real world. A better semantic theory must encompass both. Now here it's worth commenting that traditional semantic theory, probably for Putnam, he's thinking Frege. And in Frege, the contribution of society is clearly left out. But if you're looking at Grice's program, that's not correct. Grice does not ignore the role of society. But Grice doesn't have this idea of the contribution of the real world to meaning. The meanings ain't in the head, as Putnam likes to say. That aspect is not in Grice or in Frege, if we identify meaning with sense. Senses aren't in the head exactly for Frege, but exactly where they are or what this third realm is, is, as we've seen, mysterious at best. It looks like Frege is endorsing the existence of a third realm, but he can't do that because existence refers to the realm of objects and senses, whatever they are, are not objects. So there's a problem here. In any case, I think Putnam has in mind a sort of Fregean semantic theory, not semantics in general. So a couple of thoughts. Putnam contrasts what is conceivable. This is, I think, one of the most troubling parts that needs further explanation and exploration here. Putnam says it's conceivable that water isn't H2O, and it's worth wondering, what is this conceivability notion? One idea here is conceivability just amounts to epistemic possibility. For all we know, or at least at some point in history, for all we knew then, water wasn't H2O in particular during the initial work being done in chemistry. Maybe water was H2O. They didn't know. They had to figure that one out. It's something that empirical research had to discover at some point in history. So at some point, we as human beings didn't know that water is H2O. And maybe that's what it means for something to be conceivable. Or maybe conceivability is stronger, but let's go with the epistemic possibility idea for a moment. So we're going to say Putnam means to endorse that it was or is epistemically possible that water isn't H2O. But then consider the standard axiom. This is very standard. It has been questioned, but it's very standard to say it's epistemically possible means epistemically possible that P means that not P isn't known to be true. So it used to be epistemically possible that water wasn't H2O, but on the assumption that we now know that water is H2O, it's no longer epistemically possible that water is H2O. In that case, it's no longer conceivable. But if you look, Putnam wasn't endorsing the at some point in human history it was conceivable. I think he's endorsing that it is now conceivable. So on this standard account of epistemic possibility, conceivability has to be a different idea than epistemic possibility to make sense out of what Putnam is saying. So granting these links leads straightforwardly to skepticism if Putnam's idea is going to be endorsed, identifying it with epistemic possibility. It's not now known that water is H2O either. So identity claims involving propositions expressed by sentences involving rigid designators can't be known to be true either. Nor can, so you can't know what Clark Kent is Superman 
and presumably there are natural kind terms. I think jade is supposed to be an example that's ambiguous. In any case, you could have two different natural kind terms. Think of the ordinary natural kind term for oak tree. In fact, let's say live oak tree, very special kind of oak tree. Presumably there's a scientific name for a live oak tree, but I don't know what it is. And the identity claim between the two would be necessary, but the falsity is supposed to be conceivable. But it is known that live oak trees are identical with whatever their scientific name is. So you either have to say, no, we really don't know that, or we have to break the link between epistemic possibility as usually understood by the axiom I just mentioned, and conceivability. What should we do here? We might want to give up the conceivability point, but that's not going to be enough. You have to have some way of accounting for how it's a substantive scientific question, what water is and how it and how it was a discovery to learn the nature of water. The natural way to express these points is in terms of epistemic possibility. So you either have to give up the epistemic possibility point and find some other way to explain what science was up to. It's probably not the right way to go. Or you have to deny the standard axiom about epistemic possibility. Or you have to invent some other thing that this language of conceivability is, a, is about. It doesn't imply epistemic possibility of truth. It's something else entirely. So what is this something else entirely? There are some attempts being made or that have been made to say what this notion of conceivability is. We don't have time to go into them, but David Chalmers, for example, has a dual role semantics over possible worlds that's worth looking at if you're interested in exploring that idea. The other author that I asked you to read is this beautiful paper by David Lewis called Mad Pain and Marshall, Martian Pain. So what I want you to see here is there are two views about things in the philosophy of mind. The identity theory that says pain just is a certain brain state involving C fiber firings, and then a functionalist account which identifies pain with its role in bringing about behavior. It plays a role in generating human behavior of a certain kind, wincing behavior, loud noises, curse words at high volume, those sorts of things. Mad pain and Martian pain addresses two objections one to each of these kinds of approaches. So what is mad pain? Mad pain feels just like our pain feels. The feel, the phenomenal character of the experience is exactly the same. But if it's mad pain, it has different causes and different effects. So the functional role of mad pain doesn't line up with the functional role of pain in us. That's why it's mad pain. Here's what he says about this. He's trying to keep you from saying, look, that's not pain at all. Lewis says, I needn't mind conceding that perhaps the madman is not in pain in quite the same sense the rest of us are, but there had better be some straightforward sense in which he and we are both in pain. Now, this is an important point because he's adverting to trying to drive all of your metaphysics off of meaning. Some people say, look, we just got to figure out what the meaning of the sentence is, X is in pain, and that'll tell us what the reality is that we're speaking about. Lewis is more cautious about meaning. Maybe there's some sense, some semantic notion on which Mad pain doesn't count as real pain, but there better be another one on which both the madman and we are in pain. So there's some sensation that from the inside feels the same for both of us. So don't try to introduce ambiguity, semantic ambiguity to explain away the possibility of mad pain. 
Okay, what about Martian pain? The Martian feels pain just as we do, but it's physically realized quite differently. So we are in, this is a general, by the way, this is a general functionalist response to identity theories of any sort. So for example, you're in pain, you have a particular kind of nervous system, you have a particular kind of brain, and when you're in pain, there's certain physical states that you are in. But there's no particular reason functionalists think to assume that every creature capable of being in a pain, being in pain is physically structured like you. You might do this with fancy examples involving, I mean, you're a carbon-based entity. Robots are perhaps silicone-based. Is it possible for a robot to be built who's in pain, which is in pain? I don't know if you want to go personal about robots, but whatever. Could a robot experience pain? You can do fanciful examples like that, but maybe you should do it with science fiction-y, alien life forms examples as well. Or maybe you just look at the wide variety of physical organisms that actually exist. Lots of these organisms are structured physically quite different, differently than we are. But dogs can experience pain, horses can, cows can. Sentience, the capacity to experience pain and pleasure, is widely spread across the animal kingdom. Some people think it can even be found in some plants. I think that's speculative at best, let's just put it that way. But in any case, it's spread out throughout the animal kingdom. Maybe insects of certain sorts can't experience pain. I don't know how to, I don't know what the science is on that, but there's probably ways to test that as well. But in any case, the physical architecture of organisms capable of feeling pain varies widely. The Martian pain example is just an extension of that. Martians are going to be aliens. They're in pain just as we are. Now, Lewis says they feel pain just as we do. So fine, I, I would call that they're in pain just as we are, but it's physically realized in quite different ways. And he has the further proviso mirroring the proviso he had with respect to uh, mad pain as well. So what are we gonna do? Notice, Notice that these two examples, one of them threatens the identity theory. It threatens to show that the identity theory is false. The other one threatens to show that functionalism is false. The mad pain example threatens functionalism because functionalism says we understand functional terms in terms of an input-output structure. So you get the same function when you have same inputs and same outputs. And here, we don't have that. It looks like we have different causes. So I, I guess we ought to characterize this as sometimes you have the same cause and different effects, and sometimes you have different causes but the same effects. The madman is just weird. He behaves, sometimes he cheers when you smash his toe. Sometimes he whimpers when you feed him his favorite ice cream. There's just something really weird about Mr. Madman. In any case, mad pain threatens or appears to challenge in some way or another functionalism. Martian pain challenges the identity theory. So notice a simple identity theory gets mad pain right, but Martian pain wrong. The simple behaviorist or functional theory gets Martian pain right, but mad pain wrong. So you might think this is a great paper showing that neither, that there, there's no really good physicalist theory about pain. The identity theory is wrong, a behaviorist or functionalist theory is wrong. 
gosh, I guess Descartes must have been right. Dualism is true. David Lewis is not that kind of philosopher. So he doesn't draw the dualist conclusion, which looks like it would be the most natural conclusion to derive from parts one, two, and three on the outline. So what he's interested in is what's a self-respecting physicalist to do in response to this dilemma? Well, one response is desperate, he calls it. Take the two theories and just disjoin them or claim some sort of semantic ambiguity in the use of the word pain. He grants that he's going to defend a kind of ambiguity thesis here, but not, the point is, it can't be an ad hoc one. Rather, it's a kind of widespread ambiguity that we would believe in no matter what we thought about pain. So it's generic. This is a good strategy. One of the disreputable philosophical devices that you find philosophers doing when their theory is threatened by something or other, by counterexamples or arguments against a view, is posit an ambiguity. Let me give you one that I especially don't like in epistemology. So Alvin Goldman has a form of reliabilism. It's maybe the most famous, probably the most famous version of reliabilism in the literature. Initial challenges to process reliabilism of Goldman's sort come from people defending the new evil demon argument. So the new evil demon argument says, according to process reliabilism, inhabitants of evil demon worlds of the sort Descartes was describing, are, those beliefs are not generated by reliable processes. But look, we could be in an evil demon world. They could be us. If they were us, their beliefs, if they were us, the rationality or justification of our beliefs would be precisely as it is on the assumption that we're not in an evil demon world. They are as rational as we are in responding to their experience in the way they respond to their experience. We're doing the same thing because that's what it means to say they could be us. But if their beliefs are just as justified as we are, then Goldman's wrong. There isn't justification in an evil demon world. They're not justified. We are. That's a mistake. In response to this, well, Goldman had several responses, but the one I'm thinking about is he says, well, there's two senses of justification. There's a strong and a weak sense. The strong sense is my process reliabilist view. The weak sense is this other view that you're talking about. That's what I take to be the disreputable appeal to semantic ambiguity or to ambiguity of some sort. It's the, I can draw a distinction. I hereby posit a distinction between two kinds. I hereby posit a distinction between two meanings because I see how your argument or example threatens my view. That's disreputable philosophy. So Lewis wisely doesn't just resort to an ambiguity thesis, but he says, look, this isn't the disreputable kind of ambiguity the thesis. It's not ad hoc. It's not post hoc where you develop the distinction because you see where the example or argument is going. It shows that you're wrong and nobody wants to live with being wrong. That's a joke, by the way. So Lewis's response is, uh, I'm going to defend an ambiguity thesis, but it's a widespread sort of ambiguity that we would believe in no matter what we thought about pain. So let's see if that's right. No matter what we thought, what anyone might think about pain, the kind of ambiguity I'm positing, you'll have to posit even if you're a Cartesian dualist. So that's going to be our test case. In response, then, Lewis develops a sophisticated form of functionalism. So the sophisticated form says pain is whatever occupies the causal functional role of pain for the appropriate population. So it's this qualifying phrase that is supposed to get functionalism out of the problem 
the problem generated in particular by mad pain. The population is going to have to be the clause that helps here. He says, note that pain is not a rigid designator here, so don't go with Putnam and think of pain as a natural kind term. That ought to give you some pause, because if you're thinking the primary distinction is between natural kind terms and artifacts, pain is not an artifact. So it looks like on Putnam's way of drawing the distinction, pain ought to count as a natural kind term, and hence the term ought to be a rigid designator. Lewis resists this. There's more to the world than natural kinds and artifacts. There's also something else that's not an artifact, but is nonetheless functional. Thus, in Putnam's terms, pain is not a natural kind like water, but is instead a merely functional item like a chair. Well, except that in the meaning of meaning, Putnam extends the natural kinds example to include artifacts such as pencils and chairs. Those will also be capable, capable of being rigid, rigidly designated. So that's a complication. But the initial thought is functional terms, those are different than natural kind terms. So pain couldn't be a natural kind. In any case, put aside that complication to the view of the relationship between Lewis and Putnam and return to the phrase for the appropriate population. What is the appropriate population? Lewis says there are several populations which can be appropriate given particular occasions of use of the language of pain. So one appropriate population could be us. Another appropriate population could be the people we're talking about or the beings that we're talking about if they don't count as persons, dogs, cats, horses, whoever we're talking about. A third possibility is the population in which X, the thing we're talking about, is normal. And a fourth possibility is a natural kind such as a species. Here's the crucial part about ambiguity coming up and how it's resolved. First, there can be conflict between appropriate populations. If X is our Martian, we are inclined to say that he is in pain when the cavities in his feet are inflated. And so says the theory, provided that criterion one is outweighed. Criterion one makes us the relevant population. So as long as the other three outweigh the first one, so that the appropriate population is taken to be the species of Martians to which X belongs. That's the idea. The other three outweigh the first one. Another example, if X is our madman, we're inclined to say that he is in pain when he is in the state that occupies the role of pain for the rest of us. And so says the, so says the theory, provided that criterion three is outweighed by the other three, so that the appropriate population is taken to be humankind. Forget the sexist mankind here. How about mad Martian pain? There's Martian pain, there's mad pain, and then we can have mad Martians. If X is a mad Martian pain, I would be inclined to say that he is in pain when the cavities in his feet are inflated. And so says our theory, provided that two and four together outweigh either one or three by itself. So notice all of these provided that. clauses. Provided that just means if, but it's pretty clear that Lewis means something stronger than if. He's saying, if we take this relativity to a population seriously, the right way to understand the Martian is in terms of a relativity where criterion one is outweighed by the other three. If X is a madman, then criterion three is appropriately outweighed by the other three. And if we've got mad Martian, if we've got a mad Martian, then two and four together beat one and 
also be three by itself. So that's the way my theory is working. Now you may think here that the way this theory is functioning is just take the criteria and add. Each one is weighted equally, and so if you get a three to one margin in the case of the Mar Martian, then he's in pain because criterion one that says he's not in pain is outweighed by the three to one margin of the other three. And the same thing for our madman. We have a three to one ratio of pop relevant populations where he's in pain versus not in pain. And with the Mad Martian, we get a two to one. So we get three to one in favor of pain. We get three to one in favor of pain. We get two to one twice over in the third case. That's one hypothesis about what Lewis is doing by understating his view, understating the requirements of his view. He's, he has to be committed to some way, some kind of weighting that gets him the result he wants, and the addition weighting would be such a weighting. The final case is harder. Now we're talking about uniquely mad and alien pain. Lewis is willing to bite the bullet here so that if there is no relevant population to which we can assign the individual, then it's simply false to say that the being is in pain. So we've got an alien mad pain where there's no identifiable social group or species that you can assign this individual to. Lewis is committed to saying, ah, not in pain. So he bites the bullet here. Is that okay? Well, Lewis thinks so. You may not. I will just let your mileage vary on the quality of that objection. In any case, Lewis then turns to the standard objection to any functionalist account of any mental state that you're in. So the response goes like this. There is a particular way it is like to be in pain, to see a rainbow, to experience the majesty of a great sunset while on the beach. There is a way it is like. And functionalists never address that. That's the claim. Functionalists always ignore the way it is like. So we identify qualia as what's referred to when people talk about the way it is like to have a certain experience. Let's see what Lewis has to say about that. There is something it is like to be in pain, just as there is something it is like to taste a mango, to nearly drown, to lose bodily control from exhaustion when running a marathon, etc. Functionalism, whether simple or sophisticated, has nothing to say about this what it is like phenomenon and so must be defective because it just doesn't fit the phenomenon being described. Central to, to being in pain is the what it's like phenomenon. Lewis's response is this, yes, it would indeed be a mistake to consider whether a state is pain while ignoring what it is like to have it. Fortunately, I haven't made that mistake. Indeed, it's an impossible mistake to make. A theory of what it is for a state to be in pain is inescapably a theory of what it is like to be in that state, of how, it, how that state feels, of the phenomenal character of that state. Only if you believe on independent grounds that considerations of causal role and physical realization have no bearing on whether a state is pain should you say that they have no bearing on how that state feels. Sometimes philosophers characterize this last remark in terms of the language of begging the question. So you might summarize what Lewis is saying here if you're that kind of philosopher by saying, the example begs the question. It assumes that my theory is false. This language of begging the question is, again, one of those overused philosophical devices, and Lewis himself doesn't use that language, so I'm not going to use it here. So 
some commentary on Lewis's response to this objection and other, thing, for other things in the paper. First, notice the post hoc character of all of the explanations. Uh, remember the four categories we had was the category of Martian pain, mad pain. Let's see, what was the third category? Mad Martian pain and then unique mad and alien pain. Wouldn't a better theory put us in a position to predict whether an experience is an experience of pain? Imagine a future with much better targeted drugs for treating a variety of negative types of experiences. Pain is one of them, but there are others. Stress, anxiety, nausea, grief, jealousy, vengefulness, etc. What we need here are diagnostics. Does the identity theory have an advantage here over a functionalist one? So suppose you're trying, you've decided to devote your life to creating drugs to deal with all of these negative kinds of experiences. An identity theory that identifies these psychological states with mental states, I'm sorry, with brain states of a certain sort, or maybe not even brain states, but physical states of one sort or another. That gives you a nice recipe for developing the drugs you're after you make drugs that target the physical state. Suppose you want to make a drug to target a functional state. How do you do that? It makes it look like functionalists always generate, at best, post hoc explanations of states after we're already in them, but won't give you any help diagnostically for determining whether a state is one of the psychological states that you're after. So you have, you have um, Lewis's theory with its relativity to a relevant population. And now you notice that an individual is in a particular state, psychologically speaking. They're having an experience. How does the theory help you decide whether that's a state of pain or not. It looks like when you start adding up the criteria, you're doing something post hoc. Yeah, I wanna count this as a state of pain, so we get a three to one margin in favor of pain. And then if we can't let the adding work or whatever uh, mathematical function on the four criteria you want to use, if we've got mad, unique, and alien pain, or an experience in a mad, unique, and alien individual, what's the right thing to say? Is it, if you get this relativity to populations, does it turn out that no matter which of these negative experiences we're considering, we'll always deny that they're having any such experience? But what's obvious is that they're having some sort of negative experience. We gotta decide which one it is. If relative, relativity to population, to appropriate population, were the right way to proceed in identifying these negative experiences across the board, we'd have to deny that there's any negative experience at all that they're considering. So turn to the second one. Lewis rules as impossible the idea of mad, alien, and unique pain. Consider what he should say about other examples. Think of artificial intelligence robots, all of whom are in a physical state that leads to the same behavior we see in humans. Suppose we're trying to make life like artificial intelligence robots. So they're functionally indiscernible from us, but who feel no pain. Lewis, I think, holds that such creatures aren't possible. But in some sense, we need a possibility here. Conceivability, this goes back to the points we were talking about with Putnam. There's some notion of conceivability on which it's conceivable that we build robots that can be in pain. Yes? No? In some sense, that looks like a possibility because we consider the possibility that we're making self-conscious beings when we're making robots. Now, some people think that's just not even remotely possible. But if you start pressing, is it conceivable in some sense that we accidentally hit on a recipe for doing that? I mean, after all, look, if evolution can produce self-conscious beings, why can't we? We're not, we're not as sophisticated as evolution in that sense, but I don't know why it would be impossible for us or inconceivable in some sense. So the same skeptical worry 
appears here with Lewis's rejection of this possibility that came up with Putnam. Maybe the possibility in question is incompatible with knowing that Lewis's functionalism is correct. So maybe what we have to say is maybe Lewis's functionalism is correct, but we can't know that that's true. I don't know. I don't know what we're supposed to say here. But Lewis's response to the mad alien unique pain example is, I think, the least persuasive part of the paper. Is that really what we want to say, that we just bite the bullet and say, nope, not in pain? And then if we generalize to, well, it looks like there's some sort of negativity of experience that's going on, isn't there? Nope, there's no experience of a negative sort at all. Are they having an experience of any sort, neutral now? Is that a neutral experience? It looks like you're going to be forced on this sophisticated functionalist account to deny the possibility of experience itself. In any case, these are wonderful and thought-provoking papers from the initial couple of decades after the demise of positivism was complete. That happened by the end of the 1960s, at the latest. When we turn to philosophy being done after that, the notion of meaning is not driving the story. We don't need a semantic account to figure out what our metaphysical system is supposed to be. There's still going to be some connection between logical form and metaphysics, but everything became more open up in the air as to exactly what we're doing. The connections between language, thought, and the world are the most perplexing of all in philosophy. It is, in some sense, the soul of philosophy. And so lemmings, people who investigate the connections between language, epistemology, metaphysics, and mind, are among the most important philosophers since the 1960s ended. Among the best of these, the most important of these, are both Putnam and Lewis. They're worth studying, worth reading on their own, independently of the two papers that we've looked at here. But in any case, that's the end of our discussion of the history of analytic philosophy, and I look forward to reading your final drafts of your second paper when they come in.